good evening. It is good to see all of you. Good to have you here. Uh, if you would, go ahead and turn to Psalm 51, where we were just a couple of weeks ago. We will return there and peruse that again. We spent time working through the, the first few verses, really just a, a few words from each verse. We didn't even, maybe even cover a full paragraph, uh, but we just pulled out a word uh, here and there to try to get some definitions. Uh, if you remember, uh, as you're learning to read and you kind of get to that point where, you know, you graduate from the, the little paper books to the, to the books, you know, with some real depth to it. They start to teach you new words that you've never heard before and expect you to be able to read them. And then, but they're kind enough to give you the definitions for them. Well, we're in one of those sections where there's some words here that we use frequently, uh, but I thought having some more definition behind them would be helpful. Uh, and again, I, I, I begged your, your pardon last week and, and asked you to not hold me uh, to too high of a standard. As I tried to do that, I felt like I took apart the, the beauty of the psalm uh, kind of ruined the poetry with all of the detail. Uh, if you're like me, you like the outside of the car, but you don't really care what's under the hood as long as it goes. That's uh, I, I, just not my thing. When I, I, if, if we're out and about together and I happen to say, wow, I really like that, that's sharp. You can go ahead and start telling me the engine size and, and how many valves and gaskets and whatever those things are, and pistons. Do they even still have pistons? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure. But you can tell me all of that, and I'm just going to go, okay, thanks. I was looking at the outside. Okay, that's that. But when it comes to words, I like the insides, okay? That's how, I, that's how I'm formed. Uh, but I wanted to take it apart so that as we read it, yes, we're, we're overwhelmed by its beauty, but I don't want us to be distracted by the beauty and not get the depth of it. Uh, because I, I, I'm, I can be known for that when it comes to poetry. I look at it and I'm like, wow, that sounds really good, but I have no idea what we just said. Um, and, but Psalm 51 is one of those psalms that as we get it and we start to comprehend it, we find ourselves on our knees and on our face before God and these words start to come back because of the depth and the beauty of the, the detail, the insides, the guts of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so as we return to Psalm 51 again, uh, I hope that we'll get a, a, a fuller view and that you will make it a habit to go back and read this. And, and let me encourage you as you get to the end and you understand this is David's repentance. This is David's plea with God for, for forgiveness and for restoration. Don't only read it when you find yourself at odds with God, when you find yourself living uh, outside of his his. his, his uh, authority as you try to, to live on your own and, and, and sin creeps in. But read it even when you're not in those moments. Read it when you're on the mountaintop and you are at peace with God and remind yourself of what he's done. Remind yourself of, of where you've been. Remind yourself of, of all that you have in Christ. Recently, uh, it was either the beginning of this last week or maybe even the week before, I, I was listening to something and they, and, and they played some clips of a sermon, if you want to call it that. Um, I, I won't give you any names. You, you could probably put some pieces together and figure out who this is. Uh, nobody local, uh, but well known. Uh, but it was their son and it was his first major preaching. And as I listened I, I, hold on, let's go back. So as a child, I remember the first time I ever had baklava. You know what that is? Some of you, really? As a child, my first thought was, this is way too sweet. There's no value in this. I did not like it at all. That's what this sermon was. You ever heard that phrase where somebody says, if God had a refrigerator, you pictured be on it. That was the whole sermon. God's sitting in the stands cheering for you. God loves you and wants the best for you and wants to give you everything. And while there's some truth in that, that was the entirety of it. I tried to go back and listen to the sermon, as it's called. And it was just, where's the depth? Where, where's God in this? 
We don't want to just think of God as our cheerleader. And it was a, a, talking about God as Father, which is a very important. But it was only that side of the Father that just looks down with that smile and shakes his head and says, you're mine and I love you. You know, this is what you say when you look at the kid and you're like, I'd rather punch you right now, but I'm just going to say you're mine and I love you. But no, we, we, he, he just wanted the syrup. He just wanted the sweet. And he wanted to portray God as just this sweet, doting, loving father, which he absolutely is. But he's also a holy and a righteous God. He is a judge who sees our sin and must respond accordingly. We don't have that loving, doting, heavenly father without the wrath of God coming down on his son. And as we look at David's plea, his begging for, for forgiveness here, he's, as he pours his heart out to God, he's not just pouring it out to that, to that not to continue to repeat myself, but that doting, syrupy, sweet father. He's pouring his heart out to the God who created him, the God who set the standards, the God who, who wrote the laws and said, this is how you're going to live. And David had tried his best to live in opposite of that. He had for uh, uh, about a year at this point hidden his sin, he thought. He tried to cover it over and he tried to hide it from that righteous and holy God. And it's when he came to the understanding of who God is when he came to the understanding of God as righteous, that's when David just falls out flat on his face. And as we begin to read, let's read the entire psalm again, and we'll pick up where we left off last week. David cried out, Psalm 51, starting in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for, for I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin, it's, it's ever before me and against thee. Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, that you might be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you shall make me to know wisdom. So purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the, the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Sinners will be converted unto you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering, with whole burnt offering, then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. We saw the sinfulness of sin. We talked about the, the, these ideas of transgression, iniquity, and sin, rebellion, rebellion against authority, resistance to that perfect standard that we're held to. Uh, we talked about iniquity, that, that twisted, perverted, uh, ungodly lifestyle, wickedness. We looked at sin, missing the mark, going the wrong direction, uh, in incurring guilt from, 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 our, from, our, uh, from our missteps, missteps because of, uh, of disobedience. We talked about the seriousness of sin. It's a sin against a holy God. David cried out in verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned. I've done this evil in your sight. You're, 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 you're right when you judge. You're, you're clear when you, when you judge me. 
because you've seen it all and it's against you. David is not discounting the fact that he, that he had committed adultery. David is not discounting the fact that he had, he had uh, willingly and purposefully sent one of his best men to the front lines in order for him to get killed. David had blood on his hands. David sinned against uh, Uriah and Bathsheba. David sinned against the nation. But most importantly, David recognized this sin is against a holy God. I have rebelled against you. I have, I have turned aside. I have gone the, the, my own way. He recognized that seriousness. He recognized the destruction that would come. David learned because of who God is, just how sinful sin is. And we like to forget that sometimes. We like to play it down. We like to think of it, well, it's not that bad. We even, we even have coined phrases such as victimless crimes. And we talk about that when it's political, but we want to pretend it's not true and hide it in our own heart. Well, nobody's getting hurt by this. <laughs> I can do this. God didn't want me to do it in a way that would hurt people. No, God said, don't do it. God said, don't go there. God said, I set a boundary for, of protection for you. Stay in it. You step outside of that boundary, you're sinning against me. You're, you're, you're going against what I've called you to do, what I've created you to be. We started to look at the solution for sin. David started this with, have mercy upon me. That word mercy there reminds us uh, more intimately with our word for grace. Have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness, your steadfast love, your faithfulness, your loyal love, and your tender mercies, your compassion, your pity. David, David, David asked for all of these things because of who God is. David never in this, in this repentance steps up and says, God, you'll, you, can you forgive me because I'm the king of your people? Remember, I'm the anointed king that you chose to lead your people, so can we, can we fix this relationship? David's, David's view was no longer on himself, but on just how vile he was in God's own sight. As we continue to look at the solution for sin, again, we've seen mercy, loving kindness, tender mercies. But look with me at the end of verse 1. He says, blot out my transgressions. Verse 2, he's going to say, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Then he's going to say, cleanse me from my sin. Let's look at these words for just a second. We're going to look at some more, but blot out my transgressions. Wipe out my rebellion. Uh, this word blot would often be used in, in, in referring to erasing a debt. David's saying, would you just erase that debt as only you can? David had tried to hide his sin. David had tried to cover it, and it didn't work. David has no payment for his own sin. David would lose a child very early on in this sin. That was not enough to satisfy the wrath of God. David recognized only God can do that. Blot out my rebellion. Wash me. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Wash away my wickedness like stains out of a garment. You've got that shirt. You go, to, you go to put it back on, and you realize there's a stain right in the middle of the front. It's like, why did I not see that when I took it off? Why did I not see that when I sent it through the wash? I've already put it through the dryer. The dryer set the stain, and we just get upset. We get frustrated, and what do we do? We toss it and go buy a new one, because same as has got like 5,000 of them, all in her size. But imagine here, when you have few sets of clothing, maybe you're more, more frugal than that, um, and, and you, you put the effort and the energy into scrubbing out the stains. Maybe you've got that, that cabinet that has seven or eight different stain fighters because you know at least one of them is going to work. At one point, I had seen a, a picture that somebody had printed out, and it was like all these different stains we typically get and all the solutions. If you got blood, this is what you put on it. If it's ink, put it on this. If it's wax from a candle, put it on this. If it's this, put do this. If it's this, why can't we just have one? <laughs> the all-encompassing, all, all all-cleaning stain fighter. 
But imagine the, the effort, the energy put into, into washing, scrubbing. Uh, the, the, this is an energetic activity. When David cries out, wash me, he says, wash me thoroughly. Put the energy and the work. They didn't have the chemical stain fighters that we do. They didn't have those, you know, 1995. Spray it on, walk away, come back and wash it, and it's perfect. No, they had to, they had to work it. They had to work what, what they had as soap. They had to work the energy. They, they had to wring it. They had to crush it. They had to just put energy into it. And David said, take me and scrub me against the rock. Beat me against the rock. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. He says, cleanse me from my sin. Purify me from my sinfulness. In verse 2. Cleanse me. Purify me. Make me clean inside and out. David is desperate for help. And that's where sin leaves us. But David, in his desperation, didn't go looking for a solution. He turned to the solution and gave it back to God and said, this is, this is all I've got. I've ruined it. Can you clean it? Can you fix it? Can you purify it? Jump down to verse 7 with me. He says, purge me with hyssop. Purge me. That's a, that's, a, that's a hard word, right? Purge. We don't like that word. It's uncomfortable to think of it. But David says, hey, take it. Purify me. Purge me. This is the, the same, comes from the same root as the word sin, as that word that is, that's going the wrong direction, that's missing the mark. This is the opposite side of it, where it's the, the, the restoration from it. And David is saying, restore me back from my, my, my going the wrong way, my missing of the mark. Draw me back. Purify me. Purge me. Put me back on the right path. And he uses this word hyssop here. Hyssop, a plant used for uh, medicinal purposes. You, you put it in the old Google, you, you, you can grow it yourself. You can still grow it, and you can use it for, uh, for uh, uh, it's a cough suppressant. It's a... Uh, it's something else to do with, you can use it for your throat. Uh, I, I found seeds online because I was like, oh, this sounds fun. I should grow this. I shouldn't. I have way too many things to try to plant and get in the ground already. I'm running out of space. Uh, but it's a thought. Uh, but if you can imagine it, uh, my first thought, and it's nothing like but similar to maybe rosemary, that kind of tall, stalky with the little leaves that, that come off of it. And if I was a botanist, I'd explain what those leaves are called. It's similar to that, but a lot lighter. Like rosemary just has that, 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 uh, it's more of a stick, and it's got the firm leaves. I don't know. It sounds crazy. And it's got flowers going on. But it, can you imagine having a handful of those and taking them and dipping them into blood and then just kind of flinging it, sprinkling that blood? And you're like, okay, where did you get that? Okay, so let's stop. What did they, where did, the first time we hear of hyssop, where is it used? At the Passover. That's coming up right soon, isn't it? Where the Lord told them, take the lamb, slaughter it. Uh, begin to cook it. While you're doing all this, take the blood, put it on the sides of the door and at the top of the door. And when I pass over and I see the blood, I'll continue to pass over. If the blood's not there, judgment is coming. In the Exodus, just before the Exodus. Exodus 12, 22, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of that door of this house until the morning. Uh, that's the first time I found hyssop. Uh, you, you'll find it again. It's used in sprinkling blood at other points, in other ceremonies, when a leper would come back and, and say to the priest, I'm clean. Hyssop was involved in, in that purification process. Uh, contact with a dead body. You were unclean. Hyssop, again, brought back in. So there's this ceremonial cleansing. Uh, th there's this, this, this purification it is the application of the blood. And so for us, looking back and thinking of that blood of Jesus that, we, that, we, that, that is on us, that, that, the, the, that the God sees, and he sees the blood of Christ, and he doesn't see our sin anymore. So when we read, purge me with hyssop, it turns our minds to the blood of Christ, the lamb that was sacrificed in our place. It turns our minds to the thought that Jesus took that sin on himself, and he paid for that. It reminds us of that Jesus paid for this sin, so why will I keep going back to it? 
laying aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face, he says in verse 9. Hide your face from my sins. Don't see it anymore. Don't allow it into your vision. Don't see it. Don't recognize it. And then again, blot out all mine iniquities. He says, pull that debt off of my account. Wash me. Obliterate, exterminate my sin. Sin is, unfortunately, a natural choice. It's, it's nature for us. We choose to sin because it's in our nature and because it's the easy choice when our focus is on pleasing ourselves instead of trusting God. One of the, the men who has been at the wilds, our, the camp where we take the teens since the, I believe since it was founded, and, and he, he is one of the few still there. Um, but he has a saying that, that comes to my mind often, and, I, and there are just two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Naturally, we choose pleasing ourselves. That's the easy choice. It's the, it's the enjoyable choice in our minds. It's, that's our first thought of, well, what, 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 what do I want? What do I like? What, David, when a time when kings go out to war, David stayed home. David made the easy choice. David, walking along his balcony, looking out, saw something he shouldn't have seen, and instead of saying, I'm going back inside, took a second look. He made the easy choice. Does he make some hard decisions? He builds up to them. In that moment when, the, when, when David sent his army out and should have gone as their leader, David's thought right then wasn't, all right, so at some point I'm going to have to figure out how to kill this Uriah guy. That wasn't even on the radar yet. But a simple decision, a poor decision. And, and, and if David had, had just stayed inside that day, it would have been a foolish decision. But, but would we have ever known big consequences? Would that story have ever even made it to Scripture? Probably not. But a simple decision led David to another easy decision, which led him down this path of destruction. Sin, again, is, it's a natural choice to us. It's because it's our nature, because it's easy. But David, also recognizing his depravity, lays it all out on the table, and he seeks restoration with God. He says, you know, I, I, I can't do this. For a year, remember, for a year, David's tried to hide his sin. He, he tried to cover it by lying. He tried to cover it by killing. He tried to cover it by just ignoring it. But all to no avail. If you read the, the, the record of these events that led up to Psalm 51, if you go back to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 and you read of David's uh, sin and you read through, you get to chapter 12 and verse 1, Nathan the prophet's coming to talk to David in chapter 12. And as you read it, all you see is, is, is what he did. You don't get any real background. You don't, you don't feel any remorse. If that's the only part of the story we had, it, it, it wouldn't make full sense. There's no guilt evident at that point. But later in life, David looks back and honestly confessed the reality of what he dealt with that year, what that year really looked like. And in Psalm 32, verse 3, David said, When I kept silence about my sin, he said, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old. They wasted away through my roaring, through my groaning all the day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture was turned into the drought of summer. David was under the, 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 the guilt of his own sin, but the weight of his, the understanding that God saw his sin. Nothing he could do to hide it would work. The, the only solution were those things that we look back on. The only solution was turning to the God who created him, turning back to the God, his Savior, the God who, who had created him. You remember he said, I was shapen in iniquity. He was talking about being formed in his mother's womb. Psalm 139, he's going to look back and talk about how you made me. You created me in the womb. You knit me together. You, you, you made me there, and you knew me then. 
You knew me before then. David, recognizing God for who he is, recognized that God was the only solution. And now we see the sanctification of a sinner. Look at verse 8 with me. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David cried out here for the restoration of true joy as opposed to the temporal pleasure that he was looking for that, that led him down this path, that led him to the, to the death of a child, to the, to the murder of a friend, to the destruction of a family, to the embarrassment of a nation. David says, restore unto me the true joy that we have, deep joy. Restore unto me, uh, or make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. That word broken may be a little more uh, better understood with the word crushed. Think of that word broken, the bones which you have broken, bones which you have crushed, and put Psalm 32, 4 back in your mind again. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. David crushed under the guilt of his sin. David was crushed under the guilt of his offense to a holy God. Do you know that feeling of debilitating weight of guilt and shame? Better yet, do you know the joy of having that weight removed and your soul restored? He said, restore unto me the, the, the joy of thy salvation. Make me to hear that joy and gladness again. Uh, bring back the joy that I had before. He prayed out for the, uh, a renewal of his heart and his mind. Verse 10, created me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Create, this is the word we have for creation. God alone has the power and the authority to create. And David is saying here, create in me a, a, a clean heart. Take this heart that I have and give me a clean one. Uh, uh, create a, 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 a re... A new, uh, sorry, my words aren't working. We'll get back to that. Uh, but this power, when he says create, he's recognizing that God alone is the one that is able to do this. God alone can accomplish this. Renew a right spirit within me. Renew rebuild a, 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 a word here for rebuilding cities that have, that have been broken down. Rebuild a, a constant or a steadfast spirit in me. Renew, create in me a, a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a, a steadfast spirit, a spirit that will not yield to temptation, a, a spirit that is not quickly distracted by the things of this world, by the trinkets this world has to offer. you've ever seen a, a, a home destroyed, do they typically replace it with bits and pieces from the destroyed home? Or do they rebuild new and better, stronger, more efficient? David says, renew unto me a right spirit, a steadfast spirit, one that's not going to give in to these temptations again, one that's going to have the power to say no and where does that power come from? The one who created the clean heart. That's why he asked him, you do the work of creating a clean heart in me. You do the work of rebuilding, renewing a, a, a steadfast spirit within me. He asked for restoration of true joy, a renewed heart and mind. He asked for reestablished fellowship. He says, cast me not away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Remind in your mind back to when God sent Samuel to find Saul's replacement. And he anointed David there. And it says God's spirit came upon David. And God's spirit was at work in that little shepherd boy, that young man, as he ministered to Saul. As he was chased down by Saul. 
David was already at work writing some of these psalms, recording what he was saying in this poetic style so that we would have it. God's spirit was at work already. And David cries out, don't take that from me. Don't put me aside. Don't cast me off. And David is no outlier here. Believers who have tried to live with their sin and, and tried to live in broken fellowship with God fully understand what David's expressing here. Like that debilitating weight of guilt that crushes the soul. There's that gnawing recognition of our guilt before a holy God. And we may know the verses that teach our eternal security, but we also have that understanding that we've spurned the relationship with God. In the dark recesses of our minds, we worry that God just might run out of patience with me. That God might just wipe his hands clean of me and set me aside. And David cries out here, oh God, don't, don't, don't throw me aside. Don't cast me off. Don't take your spirit from me. David is desperate here. Desperate for hope. Desperate for fellowship. He says again, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation in verse 12. One commentator wrote, the path of sin is a dark path. And in that path, neither hope nor comfort can be found. And David David's stopped looking there. David has stopped looking on that dark path, but now he's looking to his God. He has turned his heart and his mind back to God and saying, you do the work, you do the restoring, you do the cleaning, you do the washing, you do the rebuilding, you do the renewing. You come in and take over, clean house, do what you've got to do. He says here, uphold me with thy free spirit. Some would say that a better uh, translation, it's, it's hard to say. It could mean uh, a number of things. One is, you know, let your spirit come in and, and do the work of holding me up. Another option, and I, and I like that one, but another option is that would you support me? Give me a spirit that's willing to obey. A spirit that's quick to hear and quick to obey. Slow to speak, swift to obey. David is, either way you want to, to understand that, David is, is, is laying his dependence on God. We've already seen him ask for the Holy Spirit. We've already seen him re requesting God's aid and God's strength and God's uh, sustaining power. But he's asking here, I think, uh, for a spirit that's, that's quick to hear you. He already said, give me a steadfast spirit that's going to stand firm against the wiles of the devil. And give me a spirit that's also quick to submit to you quick to obey. When you tell me don't go there, help me to just yes sir and go. When you say don't do that, I'm quick to say yes sir and, and go the way you want me to. He's praying for reestablished fellowship and he's, he's praying that he would be reactivated for service. Look with me at, uh, at verse 13. After this prayer of repentance, admission, and guilt, and, and, and the request for restoration, he says, you've done the work. You, only you can do the work. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Then will sinners be converted unto you. He says, reactivate me for service, that I might teach, be a proper example, that I might witness of your glory, of your power, of your authority, of your holiness. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and then my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Loosen my tongue that I might sing your praise, that I might sing of your goodness, of your holiness, of your righteousness. Verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Colossians and Ephesians in parallel passages teach us that the filling of the Holy Spirit and the filling with the Word of God lead us to speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of God. And David is crying out here, Open my lips that I might sing with my brethren, with my brothers and my sisters of your holiness, that we might worship, verse 16. Thou desirest not sacrifice, or I would give it. You don't delight in burnt offerings. 
that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. He says, reactivate me for service, to, that I might teach, that I might sing, that I might worship. That I might do the, the that I might be able to, to sing your praise. Because if you can go back and, and imagine what we have about that year of, of, of guilt and shame where David tried hiding his sin, how much singing and worship was really going on in his life? Did he did he did he follow the, the patterns? Did he did he did he did he go to to the feast, did he, did he celebrate? Did he send his offerings? Did he still participate? Probably. He probably looked the part and he walked the line. Remember, he's still trying to hide all of this. He's trying to cover it. He's trying to pretend it was okay. That was, that was, that was what I did. It's done. It's over. I'm going to move on. But no matter how much singing, offering, sacrificing David did, there was no worship. There was no praise. He cries out, help me, O God. If you wanted sacrifice, you don't want a sacrifice. You don't want a burnt offering. You want my broken heart. I want you want me to sacrifice my own heart to you, my own life to you, and give it back to you for your glory. Then he cries out, verse eighteen: Do good and thy good pleasure unto Zion. He says, "You build the walls of Jerusalem. You've got to do it. You've got to do the work." You've got to do the work of restoring me. You've got to do the work of cleansing and purging. You've got to do the work of, of reestablishing worship in my heart. Now you go back and you rebuild the city. Then you'll be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering, with whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls upon thine altar. And I think David is recognizing to an extent here that as the leader of these people, if his heart is that grotesquely broken and filthy and he's only hiding it and trying to cover it himself instead of letting God cover it with the blood. It's going to affect all of these people. It's going to affect the city. It's going to affect his, his palace, the whole kingdom. David realizes that his sin is not just affecting his own heart, but his own home and his own town. And if we can put it in our language, his own church. May we see sin the way God sees it. May we recognize that grace of his hand heavy upon us when we're, in, when we're guilty, that we would turn from it, that we would turn to him. And let's just encourage one another to not just think, okay, well, this is David, and this is David after a year of hiding and, and trying to cover up adultery and murder, and, and he's the king, so lying to all the people and all of that. That's David, right. But sin is still sin. Wickedness is still wickedness. Rebellion is still rebellion, no matter how small, no matter how great. We teach that to our children. We teach them that the smallest rebellion is still rebellion, and we've got to just grab it by the root and rip it out and teach them and train them. But we want to hide those little rebellions from God and be like, you don't see this, it's okay. But again, a one foolish step on David's part led him down the path to here. Let us be careful to lay aside every weight, every sin that does so easily beset us, so easily trip us up, and let us run with endurance, enduring those temptations, looking unto Jesus, the author and the completer of our faith, the one whose blood has been sprinkled on on. Uh, on us, so that when God sees us, we are ceremonially clean, but we are clean inside and out. We have been forgiven. Let us live that way. Our Father, you are good. You are a good Father to us, and you do love us, and I believe you do cheer us on. But Lord, you are a holy God, and when we sin against you, you must hold us accountable. And we know that Jesus has died in our place. As believers, Jesus has taken our guilt and our shame on himself. But when we sin, we break fellowship with you. We rebel against you. We go our own way. Lord, there's only destruction at the end of that path darkness and loneliness along the way. 
Help us in any sin, great or small, to be quick to hear your voice, to turn to you with a broken and a contrite heart, recognizing that it is your power and your authority alone that can heal, cleanse, and forgive. And Lord, that you will joyfully restore unto us the joy of our salvation that you will put that song on our lips, you will fill us with a worshipful heart. And then we will have the privilege of leading others to you. Help us, Father. We need you. Help us to come back and study these truths. We ask all this through Jesus' name. Amen.